the triathlon coach was like, Hey, like, I, I just want to see like what your weekly, you know, diet is like, I want you to write down everything you eat and drink, like put it mm-hmm. all in the log and I want to see it. And he saw the first a week or whatever. He's like, okay, so like you wrote down your breakfast, but like what, what else was there throughout the day? And I was like, no, that is the full day. And he's, like, oh, no, no, no. Like that's, that's enough food for you for like breakfast. So we need to work on this. Oh man, I cannot wait to eat this tuna. And I go to open my pack and there is lemon pepper tuna just absolutely baking to the inside of my dry bag all over in there. But not only is it just inside of the dry bag, it's on every article of clothing I had in there, every piece of gear that I had in there. And there is no way to get the tuna off of it or the smell out of it. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 46 of the Eat for Endurance podcast. It has taken me way longer than planned to get the show back into action, but here we are now, thankfully. I think the last time I recorded was back in the fall, and that was from a closet in my parents' house, where, as you probably know, we were staying for eight months because we could not find anywhere to live in Santa Cruz. The housing market is just bonkers out here. But now it's February, and I'm very pleased to report that I'm now recording in my own closet in our new rental. So that's super exciting uh, to finally be in our own space. And in case you're wondering why I'm recording in a closet, well... The acoustics are pretty great in here, and also one of my neighbors is doing some form of landscaping or construction pretty much every day, it seems, so I figured I'd spare you the noise. Anyway, I'm so stoked for my guest today, Corey Waltering. I've been chasing Corey down on social media for most of the past year, and lucky for us, I finally got him to come on the show. Corey is an elite ultra runner and a North Face-sponsored athlete based out of Ottawa, Illinois. You may be familiar with Corey if you watch the Eco Challenge Fiji on Amazon. I know I was absolutely binge watching those episodes at the start of the pandemic. So if you watch that, you absolutely know who he is. He was one of the athletes on Team Onyx. It's the, that was the first all-black team to compete in expedition racing. You may also have read one of the many features on him. He's black, he's openly gay, he's an ultra runner, he's based out of the Midwest. All of this is not typical in the ultra running world. And the Midwest in particular is not really a typical home base for a trail runner. And he really is trying to champion just more diversity in all senses, racial, sexual, geographical, in the sport of ultra running. So we didn't cover that in this episode, but there's so much out there, articles, videos, podcast episodes, lots of really awesome stuff out there for you to check out. And maybe you've seen him in picture, you know, pictures of him racing in his signature speedo bathing suit, or I guess technically it's the company Noodle Bags, which is a hilarious name, by the way. And if you're not familiar with him at all, then you are really in for a treat because Corey is not only a formidable athlete, he's such a fun down to earth guy and a joy to talk to. So without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Corey Waltering. Corey, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm great. I am recording in a closet. It's great. (laughs) Acoustics are wonderful. Um, Yeah, I'm just so glad we finally connected. You really are a hard man to pin down. I was like stalking you on (laughs) Facebook and uh, Instagram. But uh, speaking of all that, where in the U.S. are you right now? I've been following you, you know, on social media, and you seem to be constantly on the road. Yeah, um, I am currently in Chattanooga. So, uh, yeah. Is and, that Tennessee? Where is that? Yeah. Yep, okay. Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, you know, lots of great trails out here and great weather for not being, you know, like California or something. Yeah, awesome. And I mean, I know that Illinois is home, home, but where else is kind of home-ish for you, or or do you spend lots of time? Yeah. Um. So, I guess uh, more recently, I've been spending a lot of time in Chattanooga, uh, mm-hmm. and then I actually love training in Vegas. Um. It sounds so odd that you know Vegas is a great place to be a distance runner and just kind of an outdoor athlete in general. Uh, But Mm -hmm. it really is. And then Reno. 
Interesting. Okay. That's, that's cool. I got it. Yeah. Nice. Nice, nice. And also, just before we dive in, I have to comment on your amazing Skype profile photo. Like, you're lying down, eyes closed, and in front of you is a bowl of something in a mug that says, I am fine. I absolutely love it, and I need one of those mugs. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> Where yeah. was that taken? Um, yeah, so funny story. That is actually um, from about mile, I think, 200 210 somewhere like that on the Pinhoti trail after i had just left um alabama and entered the georgia section and at that point i had been up for i think about three days with about an hour of sleep total and wow. so everyone just kept telling me they're like hey if you make it to this park there's going to be a spot for you to sleep and what I didn't know is it was going to be me sleeping on a picnic table in the middle of uh, in the middle of Georgia. That is so fun. It looks staged. It almost, it really does look. I mean, I know you're like you're in it, like you're clearly in it, but like it just looks too perfect. You know, <laughs> it's amazing. <Totally. laughs> I love it. Maybe that's gonna be like the episode picture that I'm like we need to use that one. That's that's pretty that pretty much sums it up. Oh, um, I can get that to you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, anyways, okay. I always like to kick off these interviews with exploring your nutrition roots. So you grew up in Ottawa, Illinois. I want to hear what the, what was the food scene like in your house? What are you know some of your earliest food memories? Please share that with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ottawa, Illinois. Uh, so I was born in 1990. And I would say that Ottawa, Illinois in you know, the 90s and early 2000s was definitely a very Midwestern uh, town. You know, there's a meat, there's a potato, there might be a vegetable. Um, and so it's just, it's so funny thinking about that. Um, but yeah, I just remember um, my dad definitely was more of the red meat eater, whereas my mom was more chicken or fish. And so um, I just remember me being super into vegetables and fruit. Like there, there is not a vegetable or fruit that I that I wouldn't try, and it, probably not one that I didn't really like. I mean, even now I still like everything, um, which is that's wild. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you like come into my house and talk to my toddler, please? Because we're having some issues over here. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that well, you were so willing to try things. Yeah, it was one of those things where my mom was like, hey, you have to try everything seven times before you know if you actually like it or not, which I don't know. I've done some things where I'm like, you know, I've tried that once and I really don't like that. But when it came to food, like, you know, I would I would still try it. And I think celery was the one thing that I wasn't a huge fan of at first. But then I didn't realize that celery was cooked in like, vegetable soup or different things like that and mm -hmm. um so I guess I I did like celery just not raw <laughs> yeah do you have any siblings no um nope no siblings and who was doing the cooking in your house um dad would be more the grilling side of things mom was more cooking and casseroles got it and is there anything specific to your hometown like in terms of food that like it's known for or you'd like to share or anything like that to kind of set the scene a bit more yeah so my hometown uh there are a couple things that we're actually known for um fried chicken is one of them um but i feel like every midwestern town is like oh yeah we have the best fried chicken <laughs> uh, uh, and so that was one of them then uh tenderloins were another one like fried tenderloins were just a big the big thing where everyone's like, who has the biggest fried tenderloin? Um, <laughs> so there's that. Yeah, those are the two things. And pizza, um, you know, but our pizza wasn't the deep dish Chicago style pizza. It mm -hmm. was more, more thin crust. But yeah. there are two pizza places in town and Sam's and Bianchi's. And you either liked one or the other, but you couldn't be fans of both. 
Uh, yeah, that's, I feel like that's the way it is. Like I, I, I spent a bunch of time when I was in college in New Haven and, and there were like two as Pepe's and Saul's and it's like, you either like one or the other, you can't like both, you, you know, true to one of them. Um, okay, awesome. Well, thanks for sharing all of that. So let's get down to, you know, the athletic stuff now. You were very athletic from a young age. You pursued a variety of sports from middle school, you know, all the way up through college and beyond, obviously. But track and field, swimming was on the scene at some point, cross country, eventually triathlon. So as you started to kind of compete in all of these sports, you became more competitive. And especially as you got older, did your diet or how you viewed food start to evolve, change? I'm curious, like, kind of how that whole process um, unfolded. Yeah. Um, you know, it was. It was definitely an interesting journey and still is. Um, so I was injured a lot in high school. Um, and um, I think a lot of that just also has to do with eating disorders. Um, because, you know, as I was, a, I was a pretty solid runner as a freshman, but then I also hit my growth spurt over the summer between freshman year and sophomore year. And I grew like six or seven inches that summer, which is so wild. Um, but I also put on weight as I was growing. And from like a soccer standpoint, so I was I played top of the diamond, so basically a defender, but more midfield than actually defense. So from a soccer standpoint, that was actually great. And they were like, oh, you're mm -hmm. bulking up a bit. But then from the running side of things, they were like, oh, like, are you not running as much? What's going on? So that kind of started the cycle of eating disorders, which then mm. led to, you know, I think I've had five stress fractures and three stress reactions all through the rest of high school and into early college. So um, my my nutritional uh, lens of things through late high school, early college compared to now is just completely different. Mm. If if you feel comfortable sharing a bit more about your experience with eating disorders, um, I'd love to hear more. If not, that's totally fine, of course. But um, yeah. yeah, if you feel comfortable sharing a bit more, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So um, in high school, it was uh, it was one of those things where um, basically we were taught that you know lighter is going to be faster. And so they didn't necessarily say, like, how you should become lighter. It's just, like, you should be lighter. You shouldn't be gaining weight over the summer. So, uh, I mean, anyone that has access to, you know, a computer can pretty much figure out how to lose some weight. And for me, it was, I always liked food. Uh, I've always liked cake or cookies and all of that stuff, but I realized, oh, I'm really going to have to start, you know, limiting these things and eat more fruits and vegetables and stay away from meat. And then it was like, oh, well, even staying away from meat isn't doing it. So I should still be able to eat cookies and cake and stuff. And it's like, oh, well, I probably can't eat that either. So then it's like I was trying to. So in the fall, like fall season was always the hardest for me because I was still swimming for the YMCA. And I was running varsity cross country all four years and also played varsity soccer all four years. So mm -hmm. I was doing three sports in the fall season wow. as I'm trying to, you know, feel myself on, you know, one meal a day that was some fruit and some vegetables and then wondering why I wasn't racing well or whatever. Um, so um, I don't really know that in high school there is that much structure to it. It's just kind of like, oh, OK, whatever I can get my hands on or whatever. Um, I could, whatever I could find to eat without telling people that I was eating it, but still making my parents think that, you know, I had a solid lunch and a good dinner. Cause like I wasn't eating meals at home at that point. Cause I was always at practice. Yeah. And so that was that. But then in college, um, it was the same thing, like lighter is faster. And at that point I'd already had a few stress fractures. I had torn my meniscus. Uh, one of my stress fractures was in my femur. And so uh, I gained quite a bit of weight between freshman, uh, senior year of high school and freshman year of college. And once I got into the college program, though, it's like, oh, I have to take this weight off again. I have to get back in shape. And um, basically the cycle of like binge and purge went on for that first year before I finally just broke down. and was like, hey, like this is not healthy. I don't really know what to call it. But uh, I know that this is not sustainable. 
And I know that I'm a great athlete, but this path is not going to work. And so I explained that to some teammates and then finally my coach. And they're like, oh, this is what we call it. Oh, okay. And what was next? Um, Did you get treatment? Yeah. So I went to uh, some treatment there. They actually, um, I didn't compete for a little bit because once again, had a stress fracture, then came back and like two weeks later had a stress reaction. Um, And so I spent so much time just in the pool and on the bike and just working on functional strength, range of motion, um, but also actually putting together a nutrition plan, putting together things to, you know, build some muscle back, things to uh, look at food in a healthy way. And finally, um, you know, I had a, I had a pretty good freshman year of college. And then uh, it took me a few years to bounce back. But then by the end of college, I was running pretty good again. Wow. Well, that is such such a journey, and I really thank you for sharing all of that. You know, I in doing prep for this interview, I didn't come across your eating disorder history. I'm not sure if it's something that you've shared openly, or maybe I just didn't see it. Um, but either way, thank you. Um, now, looking back at all of that now, you know, because I mean, this is such a common thing. I mean, I on in pretty much not every athlete interview I do, but so many you know, we see this at some point or another that athletes have struggled with, you know, being told lighter, you know, lighter is faster, lighter is better. You need to lose weight. And especially in, you know, a growing child, I mean, you were still a child or an adolescent, however you want to call it. And, you know, going through puberty and just growing and going through these natural changes in your body and being told that it's basically wrong. I mean, looking back on all that, like, yeah, what are your thoughts surrounding that? Or how do you, do you ever, do you talk with any younger athletes now? Or I don't know, anything else you want to share on that topic? Yeah, um, it's definitely something that I don't think people talk about enough. Um, I've talked about it a little bit, not a ton, not that many people really ask about it. So if they don't ask, I don't normally bring it up. Sure. Um, But it is one of those things where for, I just thought it was normal back then because nobody really talk to me about it being healthy. Um, It was almost like slightly encouraged at that time, I guess. Um, Mm. And, you know, it's it's one of those things that I didn't have. uh, I don't want to say that I didn't have the resources to know that that wasn't the path to go down. But uh, I guess I didn't have the guidance to know that that wasn't the path to go down because um, I don't know, you just look at some of the athletes that were Um, even in the collegiate system or the professional system back then. And it was almost like it was a, it was almost like it was an accepted culture that nobody really talked about or discussed. Um, And so, um, yeah, looking back on it now, I mean, I, I don't necessarily wonder what could have been different had I not had that experience just because I was able to, you know, become a very successful athlete, um, even, even through all of that. But, um, I will say that honestly, that's kind of why I got into triathlon and had I not found the sport of triathlon, I don't think I'd be sitting where I am today. Wow. Yeah. It's it's a really interesting path. Um, because, I mean, yeah, triathlon, and then you got into ultra running, and it's just, it's very interesting to see kind of that whole evolution. Um, I mean, do you ever feel a desire to speak out more about your experience? I know there are athletes out there who are very, you know, who openly talk about it, and they're trying to make people talk about it more, um, or is it something that you kind of prefer not to talk about so much? Yeah, um, it's one of, I guess it's something that I would, I would definitely be willing to talk about it more. Um, I, I guess I haven't thought about it too much. Um, and just with everything else that's been going on. Sure. Uh, <laughs> there, there, yeah, there, there, there are a few other things that you're working on there. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why it's like, uh, you know, how many different things can I talk about? How many different yeah, things can I advocate for? Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's something that is very important and something that should be talked about. And especially, you know, eating disorders in men um, is something that 
just you rarely hear about it. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's it's like so terrifying to me that I mean, you're eating all your meals with your team or doing practice, you're surrounded by coaches and like and no one notices or says anything or supports you. I mean, it's changing now, thankfully, but not fast enough and we still see instances where this is still going on. So yeah, it thankfully it's not as bad as it used to be, but I'm sorry you still had to, you know, suffer through that because it is painful and, you know, both physically and mentally. Um, but here you are today, obviously a very different kind of athlete, and we definitely want to get into all of that. So along those lines, um, you know, you started to compete in triathlon um, and you discovered the world of endurance running in 2014 and decided to basically ditch triathlon and your ultra running career really took off soon after that. So I'm kind of curious, like what was going on in the background here? I mean, you said basically you're recovering from this world of eating disorder and disordered eating thoughts and behaviors. And I'm, I'm guessing, but maybe you can elaborate more on this while you were competing in triathlon hopefully you were able to fuel yourself more and then moved into this world of ultra running, which is just such a different beast. Right. So I'd love to hear a little bit more as you like in this transition phase, like what your nutrition looked like and how you were starting to make the connection between nutrition and performance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I discovered it triathlon, um, basically as a, basically as a, you know, transition from only running, um, just trying to maintain some fitness as I was getting healthy and recovering from, you know, stress fractures and everything. But um, I did my first Olympic distance triathlon and found out that I was pretty decent at it. And so instead of just focusing on running for the last couple of years of college, I was also competing in triathlon. And so I actually hired a triathlon coach while I was in college. So at this point, I have a collegiate track and field and cross country coach. And then I also had a triathlon coach. And um, our, the triathlon coach was like, hey, like, I, I just want to see like what your weekly, you know, diet is like, I want you to write down everything you eat and drink, like put it mm-hmm. all in the log and I want to see it. And he saw the first week or whatever. And he's like, okay, so like you wrote down your breakfast, but like what what else was there throughout the day? And I was like, no, that is the full day. And he's, like, oh no no no, like that's that's enough food for you for like breakfast. So we need to work on this. So that's where I was, that's how I basically was able to, you know, rationalize in my head at that point that I wasn't eating enough and still just needed more. And then it was like, oh, wow, if I actually eat and fuel properly, then I have the energy to get through all of my workouts and I can stay awake during class and I can perform consistently. How wild. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah. How was that emotionally for you? Like, was it I mean, I guess you were justifying it with with the exercise, you know, doing the exercise. But was that terrifying to be eating more or how did you handle that initially? It was terrifying at first because uh, even though I was, you know, kind of starting to focus on triathlon, I still had to race cross country. I was still uh, racing on the track and everything. Oh, no, I can't uh, I can't afford to gain a pound or two or this or that or whatever. But then throughout college, I continued to gain more weight, which is actually muscle that I was gaining. And I was also gaining just this giant endurance base. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I was done with college, I think I weighed uh, the most I had over any of the previous years. But I was also running the fastest that that I had ever run in my life. There you go. Right there. That sentence. (laughs) I just want to like I just want to like put like a bunch of red arrows like surrounding that be like this, this. You hear that, all my clients out there? Yes, that one. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> lighter does not always equal faster. Boom. Um, nope. Well, that's great to hear. And um, so, yes, yeah, let's talk about, so you did, you know, you did the whole triathlon for, thing for a bit. You fell in love with ultra running. Um, you entered a bunch of races. You started kicking ass. And I really want to know about that first year because, you know, obviously doing triathlon and doing ultra, totally different, especially with the nutrition. And um, you know, what what kind of major learning or aha moments or maybe even mistakes with nutrition 
you know, did you have during that first year of ultra running? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Where to start, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, I raced my second Ironman 70.3 world championships in September. And then I was signed up for my first marathon through two weeks after that. What? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I had never run over 16 miles at one point before. Uh, so it's like, here we go. Uh, doing a half Ironman. So 1.2 mile swim, 56 miles on the bike, then a 13.1 mile run. Then two weeks later, I'm running my first marathon. And then I believe it was two months after that was my first 50K. And uh, first trail 50K also. To put. Yeah, and yeah. it was a 50K with 7,000 feet of gain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I had no idea really what any of that even meant. I I was just, I signed up for it because someone on Instagram challenged me to sign up for it. And I was like, okay. What? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was That's wild. Funny. So, wow. um, you know, I had my nutrition pretty much dialed in for... The half Ironman distance, which was at that point, I was a little under four and a half hours or so. Um, and then in my first marathon, I don't even remember what people told me to do for the marathon, but nobody thought that I was actually going to run decent at my first marathon because they were like, you've only run 16 miles for your longest run. You just raced a half Ironman two weeks ago. They're like, just go out, just try to get to the finish, you know take fluids at every aid station and take a, I think, I think it was goo that was on the course. And they're like, take a goo every hour. And I was like, okay, like how many hours do we think I'm going to be out here? But I guess I'll take one every hour. So here we go. Um, and I just remember I came through 20 miles at exactly two hours. And at that point I had had two goos and uh that is all i'd had i think i stopped wow. it i think i'd had maybe three little cups of gatorade out on the course up to that point also and then the last 10k of it was super flat and i just remember i ran 37 minutes for that final 10k uh to run 237 in my first marathon using two goos and maybe three sips of uh gatorade out on the course Yikes. Wow. And I mean, obviously you're fast, but man, can you imagine if you had been recovered and fueled properly <laughs> like, <laughs> right? and like, trained? <laughs> exactly. Like we think about wow. we think back on that now and we just laugh because I, I had no idea. And so everyone's like, oh yeah, it's going to suck at mile 20 anyway. And so I got to mile 20 and I felt pretty good, but I mean, I, I didn't know what it was going to feel like. So I just thought that that's how everyone felt. Well, but you were racing 70.3. So it's not like you're new to endurance, right? So even though it's not running, like you're still doing an endurance activity. That's four yeah. and a half hours out there. Um, so it's not like this was totally new to you. And you're obviously a gifted athlete as well. Um, okay, so you do that. And then you have your 50K. How did that 50K go? Uh, absolutely miserable. Because... <laughs> I was, hope you took more than two goose. <laughs> uh, maybe four. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> so here I was. Uh, so at that point, I should say I was living in Boulder and then decided to move up to Leadville because uh, I paced a friend at the Leadville 100, fell in love with Leadville. So then I moved up there because I'm stupid. Uh, <laughs> and and so here I have I've been a, you know, sea level athlete all of my life and then I'm in Boulder for four or five months and then move up to Leadville and um I just remember training for this 50k which was in December and or maybe it was November late November early December but it's already cold and snowing in Leadville and I'm coming from you know tw 25 degrees up at 10,000 feet to uh, Malibu Canyon State Park or Malibu Creek State Park in California. Oh, the Sean O'Brien? Is that Sean uh, O'Brien? It, it was or basically, yeah, it was basically out on that course. I just and ran it, that in the fall. It's so beautiful there. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's super beautiful. But, but hot. Oh my God, yeah, hot. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was going to be 70 or 80 degrees oh, in yeah. that Brilliant. at that time of year. Yeah. So here I am going back to sea level to race. I'm like, oh, I live at 10,000 feet. Like, this is going to be so much fun. 
and it's a two 25k loops and i came through the first 25k under the 25k course record and up to that point i think i'd had two gels and maybe maybe one bottle of fluids at that point so like 16 ounces of fluids oh my god and uh <laughs> the second 25k was one of the most miserable experiences of my life um I just remember saying a lot too, (laughs) given what I know that you've done. Uh huh. Because, oh man, it got so warm for me. I was sweating, like, I was sweating so much that I finally just stopped sweating. So my skin is just caked in salt. Uh, I think I had two more gels with me, but I was already out of fluids and I didn't really understand, like, stopping at aid stations, taking your time, eating the food there, like, all these things. So I'm just passing up aid stations, trying to keep on moving. And so I go from first to like third and you still had maybe four. So I think it was at mile about 27 and we had descended back down. And so now we're on the flat part of the course and there are pictures of me out there, just an absolute zombie. Like my arms are just straight out to my sides, just super stiff. I'm, I look like Frankenstein trying to walk <laughs> these final miles in, just caked in salt. And it was like, is he going to make it to the finish or not? You know, but uh, I did, thankfully. But oh, man, um, I, I was so miserable. I was cramping so much. Cross the finish line is on the ground. Like, I'm never doing this again. Where do I sign up for the next one? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. And what I want to know is who is this person who challenged you? And did that person also run this? Yeah, it was my friend Anthony. And uh, he was living in Southern California at that time also. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm in Leadville. He's in Southern California. And uh, basically, we had a challenge that was whoever. Uh, whoever was the slower of the two of us had to buy beer and tacos for the rest of the weekend. And I know oh, high stakes. <laughs> absolutely. You know, I ended up beating him by 90 seconds. Oh, there you go. So there's a silver lining. Yeah. But oh man, like that's the hardest I've ever worked for beer or tacos. And uh, oh, hopefully and, they tasted uh, good. <laughs> uh, like it was so funny after we finished that race and we went out like, um like i i didn't even want tacos i didn't even want beer like nothing sounded good i just remember i stayed in bed uh for probably two days after that um which leads into a funny story of i actually had mono and didn't know it oh my god well i mean there are like a thousand reasons you're probably feeling miserable given your nutrition plan in that setting but yikes that doesn't help does it (laughs) no so it was, oh. it was all of these just things happening at once that I just found to be so funny um, oh. back on it now, because that that was my start into ultra running. And uh, yeah, just that it was not the easiest start. No, it doesn't sound like it. So, I mean, I know you entered like a ton of races and you had, you know, some great success in many of these races. So like at what point in this initial year or two, however you want to look at it, did things start to click? Like maybe you learned a little bit more about your nutrition. I'm not sure if you researched on your own or someone was telling you, your coach, whoever. Um, and yeah, at what point did things start to click and you start you started to feel a bit better and perform better? Yeah, it, I definitely would say it was somewhere in that probably the following. Oh, actually, I do know. <laughs> I do know. <laughs> Comes down to a moment. <laughs> I was, I was gonna say somewhere probably in that next summer of racing and then oh no I remember exactly what it was so uh living up in Leadville I wanted to train for the marathon because you know that's what everyone does just kidding yeah. nobody trains for the marathon Bill <laughs> because uh at 10,200 feet good luck having any leg speed yeah uh, <laughs> but so I was training for the marathon and then said that I was going to race 50k and below on trail for that first year but um i ended up going back to illinois for a couple of races a couple track races uh some road stuff 
and ran short distance PR. So I'm like, oh, I'm super excited about this. Now let's go back up to Leadville for the trail marathon and try to win a spot into the Leadville 100. Mm -hmm. And I go back up to Leadville after being gone for, I think, three and a half weeks. And I got up two days before the trail marathon and uh had a very 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 miserable trail marathon um just you know being gone for even three three and a half weeks was enough that when i got back up there i didn't feel any sort of being acclimated or anything and i remember the first climb maybe it was probably yeah about the first climb on that well i guess the course is basically uphill then downhill but um it, I was at about 11,000 feet, and my hands just went numb. So I couldn't open my gels. I couldn't use, like, my water bottles or anything. My hands were numb. Then my arms started going numb. And I'm like, oh, this probably isn't good, but we still have to keep going up to 13.2 or whatever. So I just kept going up and then went back down, finished the race, and was absolutely miserable and I just kept telling my friend is like hey like something just doesn't feel right with me like something's really off like what is this and my friend's a nurse practitioner and so he's like oh uh it's like what did you eat and drink during this trail marathon and I go well my hands went numb once I hit about 11,000 feet so I didn't take in any fluids or calories uh <laughs> during this race oh and he's like, how long were you out there? And he's like, ah, four and a half hours or so. It's like, oh, my God. He's like, dude, he's like, we have to fix this. So that is when I got my big, uh, my big lecture in nutrition for ultras, nutrition for altitude, um, all of these things. So at that point, he's just like, OK, every single run you go on for the next couple months, like, I expect a report back of when you took in your fluids, when you took in your calories, all of this stuff. You need to keep track of all of it. We're going to figure this out. And it was just so funny, though, because it's like, oh, yeah, I guess, you know, if I can't feel my hands or whatever, then I should just probably keep on running. Like, why not? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that, that sounds really rough. But at least it brought you to this point of gaining some pretty key knowledge in your success as an athlete it sounds like yes. um okay so from there things change and when so at what point what year was that that would have been 2015 yes okay yeah, that was summer of 2015 so you were new you were very new to the sport still yeah that was uh the leadville trail marathon is only like my second or third trail race oh, maybe wow um, okay yeah, but then, interesting enough, three weeks later, I ran Silver Rush 50 Mile, and after focusing, you know, on nutrition, focusing on figuring out how my body performs at altitude and all that stuff, I finished fourth at Silver Rush, and I missed the podium by 52 seconds. Wow, that's amazing that, I mean, obviously, it takes a while to, like, train your gut and figure out what works for your body and do all that jazz, and, you know, in a few weeks. You said three weeks? Yeah, three weeks. Wow. That's pretty impressive. That's amazing. At what point did you feel like you started to have everything pretty dialed in? Like, was it quick or you just continued to kind of experiment with stuff? Um, I mean, I still experiment with stuff now. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But I will say that change from the Leadville Trail Marathon to Silver Rush was a very big learning curve for me. But uh, to basically to figure it out, like we went back to the drawing board and started out with super simple things like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And my assignment would be, okay, you have, an, one, you have a one hour run today and you need to keep everything above 11,000 feet. And you have to finish this sandwich in that one hour run at some point, just like super simple little things like that, where it's like, okay, my body can handle peanut butter and jelly at 11,000 feet at 12,000 feet. Maybe it can't handle that, but it can handle mashed potatoes. Um, and so we just literally took things one day at a time, one food at a time, and just tested it at multiple altitudes, multiple different speeds. And just then, you know, on race day, it just became second nature. Mm. And when you say we, this is your nurse practitioner friend, or you had have, have a coach at this point? 
Um, it was all of us really. Okay. Yeah, it was it was a group effort on this. Yeah, got it. And at any point in this, did that eating disorder voice ever kind of come up? Did you ever have moments of struggle with eating things or body changing, or did you notice any kind of changes as you transitioned to a different sport or anything like that? Or were you at this point pretty feeling pretty solid in that? Yeah, at that point, you know, I was mentally and physically in a good place where mm-hmm. the eating disorder voices really weren't coming up. But then good. it was awesome. It was really awesome to just watch uh, my progression from, you know, r- running 30 miles a week and getting stress fractures on 30 miles a week to then being able to run 80 mile weeks in the mountains and, you know, have elevation gain with that and not be getting injured doing that, and then have that translate over to 100-mile weeks on the road training for marathons, and not be getting injured that way. And so I guess in my head, it was more, um, I wasn't worried about what my body looked like, but I was seeing the results and how it was performing, and I'm like, this is this is what I need. Absolutely. And at what point did you kind of don that Speedo and that kind of became one of your signature looks? Because, I mean, especially as someone with a history of of eating disorder, like your body is on display in that. Like, was there ever, at that point, you just felt confident and good about your body and there was no issue there? Like, is there ever any self-consciousness or anything like that with the Speedo? Yeah, that was um, 2016. And that, I mean... Mm -hmm. I, I forgot my racing shorts uh, for a 50K that I was doing down in Florida. So uh, my racing attire that day became a crop top and a Speedo. And <laughs> uh, in my eyes, it was like, okay, this is functional. This is totally fine. We're good with this. Um, and then it was funny because uh, I won the race and like that photo just went viral of me winning this 50K and a crop top and a Speedo. And it wasn't even until after the race where he's like, oh, man, like, that's that's me in a crop top and a Speedo and everyone's seeing all of this now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but people are just like, oh, that's amazing. And I'm like, I guess it is, you know, so here we are. And nowadays I'm like, whatever, I'll post Speedo pictures all the time. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, well, it's like we expect you to wear or I guess it's the uh, noodle bags is the thing you wear, yeah, which is you know, so funny. You know. Um But what do you do in the winter? Like, you can't wear that in the winter. You have to wear something else, right? Uh, Yeah, or just, you know, double up. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I've I've raced, like, I've done Frozen Gnome 50K in Crystal Lake, Illinois, uh, in below zero start temperatures in a speed on a long sleeve. You are insane. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Good for <absolutely>. you, though. <laughs> wow. Um, all right. So, you know, just because we're moving kind of chronologically, I suppose, you know, you're, you know, kind of progressing through your ultra running career, you're doing lots of runs, you're doing all this stuff, and you get into Eco Challenge Fiji, which, I mean, I know I was absolutely binge watching that um, in at the start of the pandemic. It was so much fun to watch. I had Nathan on the show earlier, um, so I'm definitely eager to hear your perspective on all things nutrition. Um, we won't get into any of the nitty gritty of the show because, first of all, it's ages ago, and second, like there are a thousand podcasts out there that you can learn about it. I just wanted to focus on the nutrition, but you, of course, did this event as part of Team Onyx. Um, you did have to drop out of the race, which sucked, but um, but you were in it for a while, and I really want to hear about, you know, how you fueled yourself in all these different disciplines you had to do, many of which were were new to you or fairly new to you, um, and what, you know, nutrition challenges you faced when you were in Fiji. So anything you'd like to share on that would be awesome. Yes. Uh, Eco Challenge was awesome. Uh, the experience, I mean, it was great. Um, just learning the new skills for that was just awesome. Uh, very thankful for that opportunity to d- just do that. Um, the nutritional challenges in Fiji start uh, with just getting there. Um, yeah. Like it's Chicago to somewhere in California, either LA or San Francisco, and then you still have a 13 hour flight to Fiji. Um, so there you go. But <laughs> once you get to Fiji, uh, only certain things can make it through customs. So certain meat can make it, certain things can't. So I didn't, I don't think you could bring like beef jerky or turkey jerky or anything like that. 
Um, certain nuts and seeds also couldn't go through customs um, and a few other things. So uh, that was that was one of the first challenges of just figuring out, OK, what am I going to pack that I'm going to fly with that will be that won't get confiscated once we get there? So then uh, the next challenge is. Once you're there and you have all your stuff there, you have to go to a Fijian grocery store and uh, just figure out what is what. And, <laughs> and, and uh, does it need to be cooked? Does it not need to be cooked? Uh, can this be something that you can take out of its original package and put into a smaller Ziploc bag or a smaller package that is going to sit in your backpack for two or three days without being refrigerated and still be good? Like, you, there are just, <laughs> there are so many things that, uh, I guess I hadn't thought about. Mm. Uh, and so, you know... When you're tra- when you're going to say even a hundred mile race that you that you could potentially be out there for two nights, um, okay, but you're still going to have your crew, or you're going to have aid stations or something like that along the way. Whereas with this, you have your food and your fluids, and you may not see your crew person for two or three days, and yep. so. So um, that's that's kind of wild. And then um, I know how many calories and how how the amount of fluids I need when I'm out running for, say, 50K. But when I might be trekking 50K, the the caloric need might be different or I know how long it might take to mountain bike 100 kilometers. But then what if you're hike a bike for half of that? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and so you have to kind of overestimate, you have to, I guess you don't really want to overestimate on the calories because that's just more weight that you have to carry in your pack. But someone like me, like in a hundred mile race, I mean, I'm putting down 350 calories an hour. And if I'm going to be out there racing around the clock for two or three days without seeing my crew and say like an eco challenge, it's not going to be that high of intensity that I need 350 calories an hour, but I'm still going to make sure that I'm getting those calories in because otherwise like brain function starts to, you know, get a little foggy and I just get cranky. Yeah. 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 Um, any other like specifics you can share any like think like any little disasters that happened or big disasters in terms of the nutrition side of things or um yeah anything else that kind of occurs to you I mean I you've told the story on a couple of podcasts about when your boat capsized and all of that and and of course as I was listening to it I was like wait what about, I guess their gear like your gear was probably in like dry packs and such but like you're out there a long time and I'm thinking but you're sitting still and I mean, there are just so many things, so many moving parts to this. Trying to figure out how to fuel yourself appropriately it just seems impossible, you know? <laughs> um, but I don't know if there are any other stories like that or things you want to share specifics about your experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the disasters that I had when it came to nutrition was um, I, I love SpaghettiOs. SpaghettiOs with meatballs, like, mm, I, could, I can eat those cold <laughs> all day long. Ugh, I'm so, shuddering. <laughs> oh, see, I love it. Like, and I mean, I'll even just be at home sometimes and I'll open a can just because I can. Um, and so uh, I I flew with them to Fiji and uh, somehow the ones with the little meatballs in them, they were OK. So they got through customs and I was able to have some of those during the race. I was super thrilled about that. Mm-hmm. But um, tuna. We we were able to buy tuna in the Fijian grocery store, but because it comes in a tin can, uh, you know, ounces make pounds, pounds break backs. So take it out of the tin can, put it into a plastic bag. Oh no, bag. I know and, where this is going. <laughs> and you should always double bag any Ziploc oh, bag no. that you're going to do. Well, uh, you know, as I'm just packing everything, getting things separated in diff- different, you know, dry bags for different parts of the course or whatever. Uh, I apparently didn't double bag my tuna um, in any of these bags that it was going into. 
And uh, we were finally at a spot where we were going to sit down and take like 15 minutes to eat, actually take in some good, uh, good water, filter some water. And I'm like, oh, man, I cannot wait to eat this tuna. And I go to open my pack. And there is lemon pepper tuna just absolutely baking to the inside of my dry bag all over in there. But not only is it just inside of the dry bag, it's on every article of clothing I had in there, every piece of gear that I had in there. And there is no way to get the tuna off of it or the smell out of it. I was afraid afraid that's where you were going. And that literally is my worst nightmare. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Wait, at what point was this at, like in the whole thing? This was somewhere on day 2. Oh and no. So, and so like I had I had not even had to open the inside of like my pack until that point in the race. So I don't know where it broke or what. But all I know is that bag broke open in there and there's just tuna all over everything. It it smelled like it had probably been in there for two days. And oh, so no. I'm going to get, you know, my base layer out because I think we were getting ready to get on water and it's supposed to be cold and I'm getting ready to get my base layer out. And I just remember almost throwing up at the smell of my gear and then having to actually wear that gear because that is the only base layer that was in that bag see this is the detail that should have been on the show because <laughs> yep. wow just wow like I have no words oh my god yeah. what did and your poor teammates I mean you were suffering obviously but your teammates had to deal with that stench too yeah oh when so did you get a relief from this did you get to change out clothes like at, at, with your crew or like how did, what happened yeah, when we made it to Camp One, I believe that is where <laughs> that's where we got to switch out uh, gear. But uh, <laughs> but one of my base layers was put into like the emergency dro- uh, drop bag that was going to be put somewhere else on the course. So I still had to keep that same base layer, <laughs> but I at least got to switch out some of the other stuff. But I had to keep the same pack, the same dry bag, and that same base layer. So I mean. For the rest of the race, everything still smelled like tuna. And I don't think that I had tuna, especially not a lemon pepper tuna, for almost two years after that race was over. I can't blame you. And and how many days were you guys in the race? Uh, five or six. And so, I mean, that's five or six days of just smelling like baked lemon pepper tuna that oh should my not God. be baked. And you guys like, it's not like you guys can totally avoid each other. Like obviously like mountain bikes, like whatever, but there are some disciplines when you're pretty close together. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. like they are smelling you. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh like, my God. See, and it was, the, oh man. I'm <laughs> cringing. What a wonderful story. <laughs> Horrible for you, but wonderful <laughs> for me. Story. Yeah, this and is the juicy stuff. <laughs> totally. And the best part about this is when I opened my pack and smelled that, um, Chris, one of our teammates, was there and he goes, You forgot to double bag it, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of a detail that maybe he could have included when you guys were packing. I don't know. <laughs> it was just so funny. I was like, Yes, I forgot to double bag it. And he's like, he's like, mm-hmm. He's like, I know. Oh, oh well, you will never ever make that mistake again. I guarantee it. Or maybe you'll just never bring tuna on yeah. any type of athletic event. Um, oh. Wow. Any other similar things or any other interesting stories from that experience that you'd like to share today? Um, you know, I think that's probably the best one. <laughs> it really is a good one. Thank you for sharing that. That's a really, really good story. Um, all right. So you come off of Eco Challenge Fiji. Um, you know, that's like a whole thing. Um, and of course the pandemic hits, everything shuts down and that's when you decide to do, um, or attempt a fastest no time or FKT on the ice age trail, which for anyone who's not familiar is a 1,147 mile trail in Wisconsin. And you complete it in just over 21 days, which is such an epic accomplishment. So let's like just dive into nutrition on that. Cause that's like a whole separate, different kind of interesting situation. <laughs> I mean, organizing nutrition for such a long uh, 
uh, just are such a massive feat of endurance. I mean, that's insane. It's like a whole massive project in itself. So tell me how you prep for this. I heard a little, t- I heard some tidbits on, uh, you know, other podcasts about Walmart and cans of things, but, um, but yeah, I'd love to hear how you prep for this and if it was different from past nutrition strategies and, and what your nutrition actually looked like once you were out on the trail. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> So nutrition for this was completely different than anything I'd ever done before. Um, Because, I mean, I wanted, originally, I wanted to average 100K a day uh, and be done closer to 16 or 17 days. Um, Ended up being, you know, just over 55 miles a day for 21 days. And it was, it was wild because I, as as I was looking back at the information of people that have done it before and the restaurants that were going to be open and uh, different places you could stop, different places to resupply and all of that, um, we we totally didn't take into consideration that most of Wisconsin was kind of shut down because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Um So, or if it wasn't, uh, or if it wasn't shut down, then basically everything was closing early. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, campgrounds were not open. So our strategy of camping and using, uh, camp stoves, like all that ended up not happening. And then in these super small towns that we were going into, uh, everything was closing at four or 5 PM, wasn't opening till 10 or 11 AM. So that did not help things. And so basically, basically, it ended up being a 21 day gas station buffet. And um, and then anything that, you know, the wonderful trail community brought out to us as they saw the van. Wow. Wow. And but you did also have like canned goods as well, right? Did I? I heard that somewhere. Okay. So you did like your SpaghettiOs and your chicken star soup or something like that. Yes. So before this started, uh, someone told me you should always have five foods that you can eat no matter what. And so I thought about it. I'm like, okay, I absolutely have five foods that I can eat no matter what. And they're like, no, like you need to make sure that it doesn't matter if the world is ending. If you have, you know, Five foods that you can eat that will keep you alive, you're good. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll figure this out. So I went to Walmart and just bought a bunch of canned, like, pasta, canned soup, all of that stuff, and would just sit on my front porch and eat it uh, cold and then go run. And if it upset my stomach, then I wouldn't use it. And if it didn't upset my stomach, then it went into a separate pile. And then I just started narrowing it down until I had five things that I could always eat. And so those five things were what? Uh, SpaghettiOs with meatballs, chicken and star soup, and then it actually ended up being, um, Rice Krispie Treats, and, (laughs) yeah. Lemon pepper tuna? No, just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then the other two things were cheeseburgers and, like, breakfast croissants from gas stations. Wow. That I can't, I can't imagine coming off of 21 days of running that much with like so little sleep, especially like towards the end, you were just so sleep deprived and then eating that combination of food. Like you, like you must've been destroyed from the inside out. Like you are destroyed at all levels. Like how did you come off of that? Just nutrition speaking, like, or did you crave anything in particular? Were you just like so destroyed? Like, I don't know. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, man. Uh, It was. (laughs) So I just remember here we are on the final day. So actually, I'll back up to like the final four days. So we have 96 hours left to break the record. And I still have 275 miles to run. And it's just like, okay, is he going to get the record? Is he not? And I basically just told my crew, I'm like, hey, we're not stopping to sleep. We're not stopping to actually eat. Like, all food is going to be on the go. I have to be moving while we eat. And they're like, this is not sustainable for the final four days. I said, well, we've been out here for 17, so let's just go. So uh, I sent the crew ahead multiple times and just went, had them go to Quick Trip. That's where we were going at this point. And I'm like, 
get all of the cheeseburgers, all of the breakfast croissants, and all of the little Starbucks coffee drinks that you can find. Bring those back to me, and every time you see a McDonald's, stop and get hash browns. <laughs> and and they're like, okay, like whatever you say. And so they did. They absolutely were spot on with their job, and I just had to run. And so like I was getting mine done, they were getting theirs done. But I remember the final day. Here we are. Like, all right, we're just going to make it up to the eastern terminus. And then we are going to go into town and we are going to have a sit down dinner. Everything's going to be glorious. Well, we get to the eastern terminus and there are probably 50 people there uh, waiting for me to finish, which I was not expecting. And so I finish and instead of going to dinner, we do a bunch of like post FKT interviews and pictures mm. and all this stuff. And so totally fine. People are like, here's a beer for you. Here's a cupcake. Like just give him beer and cupcakes and he'll probably be fine. And oh, no. so, <laughs> so we just kept on going and like the energy is high and it was probably 50 degrees and raining at this point. So finally around 10 PM or so, it's like, we should probably go check into the hotel. And I'm like, yeah, and then we can go to the Chili's that's right there. It's going to be totally fine. Oh, no, no, no. Like, Chili's or Applebee's, whatever it was, closed at, like, 8 p.m. So nothing was open except for this bar that was in a cast. It's an old castle that they turned into a bar. And we had called them and asked, like, hey, what time, do your, what time does your kitchen close? And their response was, the kitchen is open until it closes. <laughs> perfect response. <laughs> so, perfect. And we're like, great, we're all going to shower, then we'll head down there. So it's probably 10, 30, 11 p.m. as we're heading down there. And we get there, and they're like, oh, the kitchen just closed five minutes ago. Like, <sighs> you got to be kidding me. Because gas stations weren't even open at this point. Like, nothing was open. And <laughs> I just remember, not sure who it was that was with us in the crew that said it, but they're just like, this kid just finished the Ice Age Trail, like the whole Ice Age Trail. He's been talking about food. So do you have any food in here? Is there anything you can cook? And they just go, yeah, um, we we can throw some frozen pizzas on for you. Like, so that was like your big celebratory meal? <laughs> yep, frozen pizzas and old fashioned. Um, oh, man. Yeah, and um, I was I was like devastated by this. Like, here I am finishing 21 days of this thing. I just wanted a salad and a steak. Those are the two things I wanted. Salad and steak. And frozen pizza and old fashions are what we had. Um, but the next morning, got up. We ha went to brunch. It was a very nice brunch the next morning. And then finally drove down to Milwaukee. And I had a wonderful salad and a wonderful steak. And... It was just so funny, though, because honestly, for the first probably week after finishing, it's like, I just want fruit, I want salad, and I want steak. Yeah, well, I mean, that's not surprising, <laughs> given <laughs> what you're eating. Um, and and you mentioned people bringing you some, you know, treats and gifts and stuff along the trails. What was one of the yummiest or nicest or whatever kind of food gift that you received? Oh, man, there were. There were some amazing people in Wisconsin, but I I have to say, anybody that brought lasagna or cupcakes to me out on the trail, uh, you all hold super special places in my heart. Uh, mm -hmm. I had I had an ankle injury pretty early on that by day nine or so, it looked like it was probably going to take me out of the FKT. So we just went on Facebook and did a Facebook Live of, hey, like, here's what's going on. We're trying to get this figured out, but we don't know if it will happen. And people are like, well, you know, what would make you feel better? And I was like, lasagna and red velvet cupcakes. Well, trail magic in Wisconsin, like whoever those trail angels were that were listening in on this conversation, uh, multiple people then started making homemade lasagnas and homemade cupcakes and just started showing up at trailheads with it for us. Oh, that's so yeah. amazing. Was, now, were you eating that cold, though, or like, like, people, or whatever? So I had a tracker on and oh. people would keep it warm until they'd think I was about to get to a certain oh, trailhead. Amazing. 
then they drive it over. I mean, it was so awesome. And people are doing this, you know, just out of the kindness of their heart, like making a homemade lasagna and making homemade cupcakes. And people are inviting us into their home so we could sleep or shower towards the end of the day. And anyone that did that also provided, you know, they were making homemade lasagnas. They'd actually have a salad for us. Like so many things like that, that were just so amazing. That's awesome. And were you ever nervous that like your stomach wouldn't be able to handle something you were eating or you felt pretty solid and you you'd practiced enough with, you know, enough types of foods that you weren't worried about that? Oh, I wasn't worried about it at that point. I'm like, if I can if I can survive uh, for, you know, almost three weeks on mostly cold canned food, then uh, <laughs> then I wasn't worried about lasagna or cupcakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I also read you were trying to get in about 8,000 calories a day um, for the FKT on the Ice Age um, trail. So I was curious how you got to that number and like, were you, actually, were you tracking? You just had like a rough sense or you were just kind of going by those, you know, per hour amounts. Um, if you ever struggled with appetite and getting those calories in, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I was anywhere between about 6,000 to 8,000 a day. And basically we just figured out, you know, what my body weight was and how many hours we thought I'd be out there and how many calories we thought we'd, that I'd be burning. Mm -hmm. And so, um, then just kind of came up with a rough estimate from there. And <laughs> it was, I, I don't think that I ever counted the exact number of calories that I was taking. Well, I know that I didn't count it. Um, but my crew was pretty on it. and. Uh, I was luckily on the Ice Age Trail, I think the longest stretch I had to go without a crew was probably 15 and a half miles. Mm. So um, I was actually seeing my crew once every, at least once every two hours um, on most days, if not more than that. So uh, when I would go out back out on the trail, like, they'd be like, okay, hand me your cheeseburger wrapper, hand me your McChicken wrapper or whatever. Like, here, sit down, here's some pizza rolls, and here's some SpaghettiOs or whatever. And then they'd send me back out with two more cheeseburgers in my pack and just mm. stuff like that, you know? So, like, as long as I was finishing my food before I'd get back to my crew, then I was never really worried about getting enough calories in because I just had it. Um, yeah. And so... Okay. My crew was super on top of that, and they were also great about if they realized, hey, maybe I couldn't get, you know, that 300-calorie cheeseburger in or whatever, then they'd have something like Ensure or like a protein shake or just something to get some mm -hmm. calories in. Um, and worst-case scenario, if I really just wasn't able to get things down, uh, then we were using beer. <laughs> wow. Okay. Got it. Um, all right. So that happened that was amazing um congrats again on the fkt and let's get back to to where you live or i guess your home base ottawa illinois um you're of course on the road a lot and we can talk a little bit about kind of how you handle travel just in terms of the nutrition i mean obviously it's not going to fiji but still travel can be challenging um but when you're in your hometown that presents a whole different set of challenges because the temperatures can be very extreme <laughs> in the summer and in the winter so i was just curious from a nutrition perspective how you handle these extreme conditions how you adjust your nutrition um to to you know support all of that yeah um honestly the last uh year or two i've just been uh trying to avoid the extreme temperatures and only being there when it's more mild uh, there you go that's the solution <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and like even right now, I mean, I'm down in Chattanooga and I've been here mm -hmm. since like November, I guess. Um, okay. And so uh, but I mean, it still gets cold down here. It doesn't get as cold as Illinois, though. Uh, yeah. But it's one of those things where now I'm at a point where I understand that, you know, you can't be at quote unquote, race weight all year long. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there are going to be seasons that you do put on weight, you're going to put on fat, you're going to put on muscle, like you're going to put on all these different things. Um, and so um, I, I've gotten really good about just, just letting the season dictate how training is going to look and kind of how nutrition is going to be. Because um, mm. I've also been someone that kind of struggles with the winter being more gray and cold and, you know, uh, not always super motivated to get out there with that. So it's like, cool. Like if I'm going to be, you know, like I'm just going to embrace the body that I have in the winter and be totally fine with that and then get ready to rock it in the summer. Yeah. 
absolutely. And I mean, I see that you're currently sponsored by Kodiak Cakes, which I love so much, by the way, and um, Gnarly Nutrition. So I'm curious how you linked up with uh, these companies and if you have any other favorite sports nutrition products or other food products that you're using. Yeah, those are the main two that I'm using. Um, And so I met uh, the people from Gnarly out at one of the races in Utah, and uh, they were just super cool. And they were telling me about some of their products. And I was with a different nutrition company at the time. But um, with uh, with the race entry, we got some Gnarly products. And uh, I just really liked the taste of them. And so I just started talking to them and had a relationship with them. And then finally, uh, this year, I just signed with Gnarly, which is awesome. Um, And so super pumped for that. And Kodiak Cakes was, you know, I really don't even know. I don't remember how Kodiak started their athlete team. Um, But they reached out to me about, you know, being one of their trail athletes. And I was like, heck, yes, I'd be one of your athletes. Like, (laughs) <laughs> I, love the I love the pancakes. I love the waffles because um, I've been using Kodiak cakes just for breakfast and stuff for yeah. years before. So then when they're like, hey, do you want to be on the team? I'm like, yeah, I really do. And now um, I, I love it because, I mean, they even have cornbread mix. They have brownies. They have muffins, like all this stuff. Um, and it's funny because one of my New Year's resolutions is to eat uh, some sort of baked good every day. So I'm absolutely, that's like literally my next question was asking about the cake 365 highlight reel on your Instagram. Yes. <laughs> so yes, please do discuss. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I don't know, I, I'm at a point now, so like I stopped drinking. Um, and so because of that, I was like, oh, like my body still kind of craves sugar, but I'm not drinking right now. So it's like, what do I do? And that's in like, oh, pie, cake. Like, okay, I can totally get down with this. Cause I mean, I already love cake. I love pie anyway. So I made it my goal to have a slice of pie, cheesecake, cake, whatever, every day. But now I've basically expanded that out to like any homemade pastry, like every day. So Kodiak cakes comes into play here um, because you can make pretty much any of their mixes into a muffin or a cookie so i've been experimenting making my own and you know trying to add extra protein into it and things like that and then i've just been literally eating pie from every single little small mom and pop pie shop around uh, every coffee shop like it's been amazing <laughs> that is definitely an unusual New Year's resolution. I am so on board. I fully support it as a dietitian. I love it. And it's really refreshing to hear someone make a resolution that isn't about weight loss or dieting or all that crap, but it's about embracing just delicious food, which happens to be sweets, and that's okay. Um, so I love it because I, you know, I see you often write about coffee and cake fueling your miles. So that was absolutely gonna be something I wanted to ask about. And second, yeah, Kodiak cakes is is a staple of my household. I, I make the I make waffles or pancakes all the time and throw all kinds of good stuff in there. So yeah, I I need to experiment more with their mixes though. That sounds fun making cookies and other things. Um, Okay. What does everyday Corey look like in terms of food? Like when you're back home, you're chilling with your husband, where you're wherever you're at in the States, like what kinds of foods do you gravitate towards? um, Especially after a big event. I mean, you said steak and salad um, or maybe when you're taking some time off training because I think I saw that you were taking a little break last year at some point um yeah what does kind of the everyday Corey look look like in terms of eating yeah um that is a great question there's definitely a lot of coffee uh I love coffee Mm -hmm. um and then honestly uh one of my favorite meals ever chicken strips and fries nice like hands down like you could take me to the fanciest restaurant out there. And, uh, you know, if I've just had a good day where I'm like, yeah, you know what? Like, I'm having a great day. I just want chicken strips and fries. Or if I'm having a bad day, I want chicken strips and fries. Like, it's uh, it's it's actually just funny, I guess. Um, <laughs> because people are like, oh, but you've traveled all over and you've tried all of these things. I'm like, yeah, chicken strips and fries. Like super simple. Hey, you know what you like. You know what you Absolutely. like. Absolutely. I'll try. I'll try everything though. But like that's always a super solid go-to for me. Um, but honestly, it's like some sort of Kodiak cake. 
oatmeal or pancake or whatever for breakfast, some sort of fruit, uh, coffee, lunch is probably going to be whatever is uh, left over from dinner the night before. And then dinner, sometimes it's going to be chicken strips and fries. Sometimes it's going to be <laughs> homemade, you know, meatballs that I make in like the Instapot. Sometimes it's going to be lasagna, sometimes soup. Um, just super simple things that are going to taste good. Awesome. What challenges do you still face with your nutrition? And this can be everyday eating. This could be um, in training or racing. This could be maybe not necessarily challenges, but things you're curious about, you want to experiment with, anything along those lines. Yeah, um, I absolutely need to get better at nutrition when I am at altitude, uh, Mm -hmm. especially above tree line. Um, I've... I've just really struggled over the last year or so in some of these races when I'm above tree line, which is so wild to me because I never used to really struggle uh, that much. And I guess I did used to live in Leadville for a while and even lived at altitude for a bit. Um, But like it just it was almost like an overnight switch for me from I had COVID back in. November of oh I guess well, the, November of 2020 um mm-hmm. uh, and since then like I've really struggled anytime I'm above you know like 11 5 maybe oh wow okay and so uh that's been that's been difficult for some races uh like I tried to do high lonesome 100 and this past year and I spent <laughs> I threw up 17 times in the, oh, first, no. in the first 50K of that race. Um, and then when I finally got below tree line, I started to feel good, which is like mile 49 or something. Ugh, yikes. But, yeah, and I see you're signed up for the Broken Arrow Sky Race in June. I'm not sure what the elevation is for that, but I'm assuming as a Sky Race, it's high up there. <laughs> it's up there enough. Yeah. <laughs> up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm also signed up for Cocodona 250, and I mean, yeah, I saw that. The first, know. the first climb of Cocodona still goes up above 9,000 feet. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have a pretty. It looks like, I mean, at least from the looks of Ultra Sign Up, you have quite a few races coming up. So, yeah, tell me a little bit about what's on the horizon for you. Yeah, so I'm doing a a 50k down in uh, Alabama that is actually on the Pinhoti Trail at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm pretty pumped for that. And it's just, it's fun. I've been training down here since about November. So it's just nice to race some of the things down here. Um, then I, I'm currently signed up for the Gorge 100K out in Oregon. And, uh, that was the first race that I ever had a DNF at back in 2017. So I am a little intrigued to go back and see how things are different, um, which is also then interesting because the next race after that is Cocodona 250. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I had a very big DNF there last year, which was, uh, that was just, I tried to do the Pinhoti Trail FKT, which is 350 miles. And then three weeks later, start Cocodona, which is not smart. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's rough. Start, got the FKT, but then took a DNF at Cocodona at mile 37. So this year, uh, no FKT going into Cocodona. Um, but yeah, those are like two of my bigger DNFs that I've had. And so I wanted to go back to both of those races and just, you know, uh, run them with the respect that I probably should have given them the first time. Awesome. And we didn't talk about Pinhoti. I mean, was there, I mean, is there anything to share there that was different from Ice Age Trail or any of the other kind of nutrition strategies? Did you kind of learn anything or do anything differently in terms of nutrition? Um, yes. So Pinhoti was a fun one because we, I, my friend Jeff came with us and he loves camping. And, you know, I was like, we're not really going to be camping. He's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, I love cooking with a camp stove. It's like, okay. So, <laughs> so this is where things became great because on that second day, 
it dropped to 26 degrees at night. I was freezing. I was hungry. And he's like, oh, yeah, we stopped by the Dollar General that was somewhere. And he's like, I'm going to meet you at this trailhead. And he's like, guess what we're having at the next stop? And I'm like, I don't know. What are we having at the next stop? And he's like, Chili Mac. It's like, oh, my <laughs> God, you are amazing. So sure enough, we I come into the next trailhead. And there he is on the camp stove, and he already had the macaroni and cheese going. He adds the chili to it, and we have chili mac, you know, somewhere in the middle of Alabama in the middle of the night. And it was like, oh, back to life. Here I am. (laughs) So so I think that for that next day, like every crew stop that I had is like, can I get some more of that chili mac? (laughs) (laughs) Now, Pinoti Trail is how long, and when did Uh, you do this? uh, So I did that in April. And that is 350 miles with uh, about 51,000 feet of elevation gain. Wow. Uh, and it runs through Alabama and Georgia. Wow. Amazing. Oh, well, so that was a completely different thing than Ice Age, obviously. And you had this homemade food. It was obviously a shorter distance, too. Things were perhaps a bit more open than they were initially in 2020. Um yes. So, yeah, very different experience. Do you think you you want to get back to some FKTs uh, after this lineup of races you have? Or are you kind of over it for now? Yeah, um, I definitely would like to get back to some. And uh, I'm in a couple lotteries for this fall. And so I'm just waiting to see what happens with some of those races this fall. Um, otherwise, uh, I had talked about going after an FKT on the AT. Um, a southbound attempt this fall and and i honestly think i'm gonna push that back until next year um just to give my body a little bit more of a chance to rebuild after after uh ice age and pinhody because i did not let myself recover enough after pinhody last year and that just made for a miserable rest of the year Mm -hmm. um So I'm this year, I want to focus more on just being consistent and enjoying the process every day rather than saying, okay, I have this FKT in this race that I'm going after. And other than that, we'll kind of figure it out. Um, So, you know, if something sounds fun, I'll sign up. If it doesn't sound fun, then I just won't run it. But I'm still going to eat my pastry every day and I'm still making it a point to get out, you know, at least 30 minutes a day, but 30 minutes then turns into an hour and an hour sometimes turns into five hours. So yeah. (laughs) There you go. That sounds like a good strategy. And are you still working with a coach? You were working or you are working with Jason Coop, right? Yes. And like, he's an amazing coach and he, he has been so supportive of you know, when I told him my New Year's resolution was at first to eat like a slice of pie or cake every day, he's like, I 100% support this decision. Uh, <laughs> awesome. And then, and then I was like, yeah, you know, I really don't know what I'm going to do this year, but I know that I just want to get out for 30 minutes a day. He's like, even better. He's like, perfect. He goes, if you do both of those things, you know, if those are the two things you do and you just do that, he's like, you're going to be in a great spot to do whatever you want the second half of the year and into next year. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm such a fan of his show and he has such like an amazing outlook on things. So um, it's really nice that you're supported in that way. All right. I have one last question that is totally not related to nutrition. Your husband, Tom, is a skydiver. Do you ever skydive or have you ever skydived? Uh, I do not. I have <laughs> not, um, not afraid of it. Just, you know, uh, I I haven't gone yet. Do you want to? Uh, someday. Someday. Does Tom want you to? Does he encourage you to? Yeah, I mean, if I wanted to jump, he'd say yeah. Does he run with you? No. Ever? No. No. (laughs) So you guys keep to your own sports? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Corey. I always finish up every interview with my Quick Bites question, so we'll run through this, and then I'll send you on your way. All right. Favorite meal or snack when you're in a hurry? uh kodiak cakes uh any of their chewy granola bars favorite meal or snack when you're not in a hurry chicken strips and fries of course favorite post-race meal uh chicken strips and fries or steak and a salad biggest cooking catastrophe (laughs) 
Uh, anytime I mix up the sugar and salt uh, containers, which is probably quite often. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely done that in a recipe before. It was really not good. Um, oh. Okay, most bizarre or exotic food that you've ever tried? Uh, oh, I actually don't know. Pro- mm. I would say... <laughs> octopus like i don't like calamari and to me that's just bizarre like that's just a bizarre food i agree it's so gross I, I don't know i don't get eating octopus but some people like it do you do you actually race in like outside the u.s very often or no you don't right yeah, a lot of oh, you South do Africa and some in asia oh okay i didn't see that awesome um what is your favorite beverage uh coffee what foods remind you of growing up? What are your comfort foods? Mashed potatoes, baked beans, mac and cheese. Okay. Yeah. I hear you're an ice cream lover, so this one should be easy. I love ice cream too. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Vanilla bean. Nice. And last but not least, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. Hmm. Uh, a puffy jacket. So any of the North Face puffies absolutely need one of those. Uh, an emergency blanket, uh, because, you know, lots of trails. Yeah. Emergency blanket and just a good pair of shoes. What about your noodle bags? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of given, but that's not just yeah, the outdoor I lifestyle. Know. I mean, those can I work know. as underwear, like whatever. True. True, true, true. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey, for your time today and for sharing your nutrition storage story with us. Where can everyone find you? Yeah, I'm most active on Instagram. So uh, Corey Waltering on Instagram awesome. or Strava if you want to follow along my training. Ooh, yes, I will follow you on Strava. I need to start using that more. Um, awesome. Thank you again so much, Corey, and hope 2022 is a good one. And definitely enjoy all of those pastries and cakes and cookies and whatnot. Oh, well, thank you. And I will enjoy all of it. (laughs) And that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, or if you've enjoyed other episodes in the past, please do me a huge favor and rate or review the show over on iTunes if you can. It really helps me spread the word to other listeners. And that helps me keep this show going. I also really appreciate your honest feedback so I can continue to make this show better. As you know, it's not sponsored. I don't get paid to do this. So any support you can show in this area or wherever else is really appreciated. Thank you all. And as always, please feel free to reach out via email, eatforendurance at gmail.com or on social media. Have a wonderful day.